As teenagers, I'm sure we all did some dumb things, had some crazy ideas, and probably lived a little too close to the edge on some occasions. Whether it was sneaking out of the house to go to parties, jumping off of cliffs at rock quarries, or just cruising around town trying to look cool. I could probably say that for most of us, murder was never on our minds. When boredom struck, we found things to do and ways to occupy our time, but not once did that ever consist of murder. Unfortunately, in 1997 in rural Sussex County, New Jersey, two teenagers looking for a thrill would do the unthinkable. On April 19, 1997, 17-year-old Jason Vreeland and 18-year-old Thomas Kokovich were hanging out and bored which is typical for teenagers, but Jason and Thomas weren't your typical teenagers and were both deeply troubled and had a strange desire to take a person's life. Jason and Thomas had only met a few months before at the Sussex County Vocational Technical School and had both lived somewhat difficult lives. They both came from broken homes and had issues with drugs. It was also said that Jason and Thomas both recently had trouble with their girlfriends. Thomas was living with his grandparents after his parents divorced and moved away. He had also allegedly told a friend when he was 10 years old that he used to prep illegal narcotics for his uncle. So it's safe to say that Thomas had not grown up in the best of environments. Classmates at the vocational school would say that he often talked about wanting to be a hitman and had even brought a sawed-off shotgun to class one day. Jason, on the other hand, was said to be less violent than Thomas, but was known for destroying neighbors' mail and stealing stuff out of unlocked cars. He had also been arrested about a month ago for shooting a pellet gun at a car passing by. Classmates would say that he sometimes would tell people in the halls at school that I'm going to kill you, but they considered him too much of a follower to instigate anything serious. Back to the night of April 19th, with nothing better to do, the two boys came up with the idea of luring an unsuspecting pizza delivery driver to an abandoned house on Scott Road with the plan being to ambush and kill them. Around 8.30 p.m., the two teens drove to a diner, then to the Kingpin's bowling alley, before ultimately arriving at a nearby Dunkin' Donuts around 10 p.m. They went inside, asked for a phone book, and then made their way to a payphone. 25-year-old Giorgio Galera, who went by George, was the owner of Tony's Pizza and Pasta in Hardyston, New Jersey. On the night of the 19th, he received a call from Jason asking if 22-year-old Jeremy Giordano was delivering pizza that night, which he was. Since Jason knew Jeremy, he decided it was best to use another pizza place. However, every pizza place he called told the same thing. The delivery address was too far out. One of the pizza places even picked up on the strangeness of the phone call, saying that Jason sounded suspicious, he was too vague about the address, and when he wouldn't give them a phone number, they made the best decision possible and declined to deliver. With no other options, they called Tony's back and ordered two pizzas to be delivered to 196 Scott Road in nearby Franklin. The delivery driver, Jeremy, was born to Joseph and Loretta on January 5, 1975. He graduated from Wallkill Valley High School in 1994 and had been on the school's wrestling team. Jeremy took great care of his family and even helped out when money was short. George, on the other hand, was a graduate of High Point High School and started working at Tony's Pizza and Pasta in 1988. He saved up money and bought the restaurant in 1993 from the owner when he was only 21 years old. He and his girlfriend, Lara Pierce, had a daughter together named Caitlin, born shortly after he purchased the restaurant. 
George had worked there for several years before saving enough money to fulfill his dream by buying the restaurant. When Jason called back, George was suspicious about the order, so he decided to go with Jeremy and the two left the pizzeria at about 10.30 p.m. George and Lara had plans to go camping that night, so she waited for him in Tony's parking lot, but sadly, he would never show back up. Meanwhile, Jason and Thomas left the Dunkin' Donuts where they had just used a payphone and returned to the abandoned home. After Jeremy and George arrived at the house, George rolled down the window and told the two boys they owed $16.50. Thomas then asked Jason if he had the money, who responded, yeah, but then Thomas said he had the money. That's when Thomas reached into his jacket pocket, drew a pistol, and started firing into the car. Jason, also armed, shot into the car as well. Eight shots in total were fired, seven from a 45 caliber and one from a 22 caliber. After the car rolled and came to a stop in a muddy area, the teens removed the bodies from the car, placed them on the ground, and fired an extra shot. They also left the two ordered pizzas on the ground next to the bodies. As they ran back to Thomas's car, Thomas said, I can't believe we did this. I can't believe we did this. To which Jason replied, I love you, man, before they hugged and got back in the car. Once home, Thomas put the guns and bloody clothes in a bag and placed them under a pane of glass outside his home. Once police began investigating the murders, they were able to trace the call made to Tony's to the nearby Dunkin' Donuts. Also, surveillance cameras at the donut shop captured Jason and Thomas borrowing the phone book at around 10 p.m. that night. The next day, Christine Slater, a friend of Thomas's, told the police that on the day of the murders, Thomas strangely said to her that he wanted to kill a pizza delivery person. They would also receive another tip from a resident on Scott Road who called the police and told them they had seen Thomas's car on Scott Road the night before. Two days later, both teens were arrested. When they were arrested, the police found the bloodstained clothes in a gym bag and George's wallet. Thomas confessed to the murders, but Jason tried to claim that he didn't shoot the victims, but instead shot the dashboard because he knew Jeremy and didn't actually want to kill him. Turns out the weapons they were using were stolen 11 days earlier. Franklin police had been investigating a robbery that occurred on April 8, 1997 at Adventure Sports on Route 23 in Franklin. It was later determined that Thomas broke into the store while his friend Michael waited in a getaway car. The store had a faulty alarm system which allowed Thomas and Michael to get away scot-free. They would end up stealing three firearms in total, two of which were used in the murders. According to Jason, the original plan was for him and Thomas to sell the guns to buy drugs, then turn around and sell the drugs. The original plan was also to rob two pizza delivery drivers, and Michael was part of that plan, but once Jason started talking details, Michael backed out and wanted no part of it. It was ultimately determined that a bullet from the gun Thomas used killed Jeremy and the gun fired by Jason killed George. After a two-week trial, Thomas was found guilty of two counts of murder and one count of robbery. He was initially sentenced to death on May 7, 1999, but 13 years later, the sentence was overturned and changed to life in prison after a jury could not unanimously decide on the death penalty. Jason was convicted of George's murder and aggravated manslaughter of Jeremy, as well as first-degree robbery. Jason will be eligible for parole in October of 2044 at the age of 65, and Thomas will be eligible for parole in October of 2072 at the old age of 94. Jeremy's father Joe said the legacy of his son lives on through his family's actions, which included establishing a scholarship fund for students at Walk Hill Valley Regional High School. 
Joe also said that he cannot forgive Jason and Thomas because they never showed remorse and never truly apologized to the family. Jeremy's daughter would end up naming her deli business Jeremiah's Gourmet Deli and Catering. George's family kept his business open, and when the karate studio next door to the pizzeria closed, they had an idea to open a dinner room in his memory called Giorgio's Room. As of 2023, both Jason and Thomas remained behind bars.